Two eight five one, turn right heading one eight zero. Papa, turn right two four five. Report localizer established two seven. Please note before you do watch this video, it is going to be filled with history and, and callbacks to the past. With that being said, and the strict copyright laws on YouTube, there is very limited free use content that I can use from the 1900s. So therefore, I'm going to fill the video with Airbus B-roll footage that I've been given permission to use, which I think may be at least interesting for you. Anyway, enjoy the video. Farnborough. This unusually large, relatively flat expanse of grassland was first used by the British Army, which was based at the nearby Aldershot. Farnborough's first connection with military flight took place when Aldershot's focus moved towards the North Camp, with the establishment of the Army Flying Corps at Farnborough Common. But first, at the beginning of the 20th century, Farnborough became home to the British Army Balloon Factory. The factory's most unlikely employee was a powered kite consultant, the American adventurer and Wild West showman Samuel Cody, who in his spare time constructed Britain's first heavier-than-air powered aircraft. On a handful of years after the Wright brothers' invention, Cody made Farnborough Common's first aircraft movement and powered flight in 1908. Farnborough's owners, the British Ministry of Defence, witnessed Cody's achievements and promptly dismissed aircraft as being of no foreseeable use. It took the Great War and the establishment of the Army Flying Corps to begin the transformation of Farnborough into what it eventually became today. From day one, Farnborough became ground zero for aeronautical development as the frantic needs of that first flight global conflict demanded aircraft that improved technologically almost week by week. Soon the balloon factory was joined by the new Royal Aircraft Establishment in the many workshops and hangars that sprung up around Farnborough, now called an aerodrome. Some of the greatest achievements in flight between the wars and during World War II were tested and developed. It was at the Farnborough's aircraft establishment that RAF officer and engineering genius Frank Whittle independently invented the turbojet engine towards the end of World War II. From the jet engine, eventually designs for the Concorde, high-altitude spacesuits, night vision aids and heads-up cockpit displays all happened at Farnborough. It might seem inconceivable to younger people, especially young Americans, that the world leader in aviation development across the board was Great Britain and her huge aircraft industries. There were so many aircraft companies post-war that for sheer cost and manpower reasons, the government of the day compelled the closure of Britain's aviation industries. In fact, Britain was poised in the 1950s to take complete control of the world's intercontinental passenger aircraft production. The uniquely designed de Havilland Quadjet Comet airliner was in 1949, head and shoulders above any civilian jet aircraft on the drawing board in the US. It's not a stretch of the imagination to say that had not the Comet suffered a series of tragic, catastrophic crashes, taking the lives of hundreds of passengers, Comets would have been ordered in huge numbers by American and other world airliners. Had there been a couple of hundred comets flying successfully in the US and elsewhere, the Queen of the Skies, the now iconic Boeing 747, may never have had an opportunity to leave the imagination of its designer. But almost overnight, fate turned in favour of American aircraft makers, and despite all the problems with the comet being fixed, it was too late for the British large aircraft industry. So much, though, for the technical side of Farnborough. Beginning after the war in 1948, what was to quickly become the world's most famous air show debuted and has been held every two years on that same space. In the days of old, it was a grassy field with crossroads, home to coach robbers and cutthroats. The ongoing fame that became the Farnborough Air Show was nearly threatened when on the 6th of September 1952, when a prototype jet fighter crashed during an aerial display, killing 31 people. Flying close to and toward the huge crowds of spectators, the jet disintegrated mid-air during an aerobatic manoeuvre, also causing the death of pilot John Derry and on board flight test observer Anthony Richards. Showing how times have changed since then, not one family member of the deceased or any of the scores of people seriously injured sued the aircraft manufacturer or Farnborough for the loss of life or injuries. And what also today seems inconceivable after the dead and injured had been evacuated, the air show actually continued on later that same day. Every two years since that tragedy, crowds of aircraft enthusiasts have steadily increased to a point now where Farnborough Air Show is not only staged for the mammoth amazed crowds, but has become one of the major events where airlines, aircraft manufacturers, governments and also militaries around the world come over to buy and place orders for the world's largest passenger planes and all the latest aeronautical innovations. Farnborough, several years ago, was wound up as an RAF establishment and privatised and right now there are huge conventions 
displays and meeting facilities, plus large on-site international standard hotels. Farnborough, the birthplace and very heart and soul of aviation in the United Kingdom, will continue for decades to come. Thank you very much for watching another one of my videos and, of course, the help when it comes to writing scripts. I do very much look forward to you all joining me in the next one. Hello.